you give me a specific example of a fossil that was found in the right place that is considered a transition between different kinds of animals? Archaeopteryx was predicted and found two years later, in not only the precise correct date range, but the precise lagoon type habitat, which are very rare and identifiable only with modern geology. That's not just a coincidence. It's because we actually understand the pattern in the layers. Unlike creationists who think the floodwaters somehow knew to separate dead humans from dead dinosaurs and dead birds, and separate the species in each kind of being, and order them in such a way that when placed in order shows gradual change towards modern forms, without modern forms being found anywhere in the lower layers, a flood would just mix up everything it hit. Somehow dinosaurs got put neatly in the middle despite being even more inland than most human populations, so dinosaurs would get flooded last, but that isn't what we see. There is no consistency in the flood model. One minute they say it sorts by density, but mammals are more dense than dinosaurs, so either way we should expect dinosaurs either on the top, because they're buried last, or on the bottom, because everything else has been dumped on top of them. But instead we find them in the middle layers, with no humans spread throughout, only at the very top. How did coastal and shallow water regions get swept underneath the inland ones? And then we see repeated rock layers of the same density not sorted together, and the next minute they talk about the ability to escape the flood being a sorting method. Well then why are swimming animals the majority of the first to die in the flood, and why don't swimming mammals show up until the top layers? Then they move the goalpost to habitat, which really doesn't work since we see mixes of different habitats and different abilities to swim in the same layers. But the sorting pattern matches exactly the evolutionary predictions. Creationists have never been able to predict or discover any fossils, while evolutionists have, showing evolution is an accurate representation of reality, since we can fill in demonstrable material gaps in the knowledge base by relying on a model of reality that turns out to be able to predict reality, rather than to simply explain what we already know to the point of finding previously unknown creatures but being able to predict their precise date range, location, and physical features. The concept of modification with descent. Are you aware of the controversy over Archaeopteryx? Was it just a bird? It has both bird and dinosauric features. Decided by who? Who decided it has these different features? Nobody decided it. But that reveals a lot about how you think, as if you'd believe it if the correct person said so. The claim here is evident by the fact that Archaeopteryx displays every anatomical feature found in the theropod lineage with minor skull differences fully accountable by microevolution. Look at the tail, the spine, the ribs, the breastbones, the hands, even the clawed toes, everything there is little anatomical or morphological difference between theropods and Archaeopteryx, especially in the body. If you look at the bones of Archaeopteryx without the feathers, you can tell it is a theropod. This is how we do things, comparative anatomy, even creationists. This is the only way we can look at and study relations between fossils. Now they agree relations between certain fossils are possible, to infer based on comparative anatomy. So that's all we're doing here. If you look at Archaeopteryx, any child would be able to tell you Archaeopteryx belongs in the theropod group based on its anatomy. And as we all know, if a child believes it, that's good enough argument for creationists. On top of that, we now know that theropods and other dinosaurs already had feathers. Feathers are evident in many dinosaur fossils, same as in Archaeopteryx, as well as preserved in amber. Many of the raptors display quill knobs that today are only found on the forearms of large birds. Dinosaurs had hollow bones like those of birds, had air sacs and pneumatic bones, and breathing systems like those of birds. Dinosaurs were also likely warm-blooded, or between warm-blooded and cold-blooded. The debate is simply on whether they were mesothermic in between cold and warm-blooded, or endothermic which is warm-blooded, and their growth rates and walking speeds inferred from the bones and the growth rings also indicate the active lifestyle typical of warm-blooded animals. 
Large dinosaurs would necessarily generate a lot of body heat. In fact, there's an upper limit for their size, even cold-blooded, that would cause overheating above a certain size. The bigger, the less the proportional surface area for cooling, and thus the hotter. All they need is methods of cooling down, which can be done with panting or vasodilation, and generating heat for muscle activity, which just requires a lot of calories. And we know they ate more than other reptiles, plus we already know of reptiles who've evolved warm-blooded traits. We have examples of cold-blooded species having warm-blooded variants. So we already know that this type of change can occur within microevolution. So the idea that a theropod could adapt or microevolve, or whatever you want to call it, into an Archaeopteryx is a difference literally of a slightly proportionally larger toe, overall smaller body size since Archaeopteryx is pretty small, larger feathers, fused collarbones instead of separate collarbones, slight difference in the curve of the teeth and skull. These are evolutionary differences that creationists admit can already happen within kind, and we do observe these types of changes within the same kind of animal. Notably, birds, which creationists are famously shy about which bird species are related, if they are even related at all, because they actually don't know what they're talking about and can't tell us. Meanwhile, the differences between Archaeopteryx and birds are much larger. One of these things is not like the others. One of these things doesn't belong. Can you tell which thing is not like the other by the time I finish this song? Is there a possibility it was a bird? It had, sure. wings, it had feathers, it had hollow bones. Could it have been an unusual bird with teeth? There's a Panamanian hummingbird that has teeth in its mouth. While the skull is different from those of typical theropods, it is much more different from those of typical birds. It does not have a beak. It has true teeth. And no, modern birds do not have teeth. Period. These are not teeth. They are called tomium. They are made of cartilage and keratin, whereas true teeth, like Archaeopteryx has, are made of bone and are embedded in sockets in the jawbone. Tomium is part of the beak or the bill itself, not part of the skull bones. Birds have fused finger bones, while Archaeopteryx does not. It has the exact same finger bones as a theropod. True birds have almost total loss of the tail. They have a very thick tailbone. They have a very thick breastbone. They have a completely different arrangement of tail feathers because they pretty much have no tail, while Archaeopteryx has a very long dinosaur-like tail. And why would God do that unless to, just to confuse us or try to make us believe in evolution? This type of tail has never been seen outside of reptiles. A wizard did it. Actually, all right, yeah. So why would God make true-toothed birds with extremely theropod-like skeletons if he knew he was just going to drown them all? Creationists never say whether Archaeopteryx is related to other birds or whether it was specially created, because either option would lead to an absurd and ridiculous conclusion either way. And they won't give an answer to which bird morphologies are capable of being related anyway. So assuming the flood model, why are all the toothed birds extinct? Could they not fly as well as the more evolved birds to escape the flood? This rules out the logic of creating them separately, since what rational god would specifically create an entire class of animals knowing he would wipe them out permanently at the beginning of human history? <laughs> so, the fact that it has similar features you are interpreting to be evidence of a relationship, I would interpret it to be evidence of a common designer for a common need. And you'd be incorrect, because God does not use common designs for common needs. In fact, everything seems to be using modified body parts from different kinds of animals, rather than parts designed specifically for a specific task. Look at birds and bats, different design for a common function. If bats had the same wings as birds, then you'd have an argument. But instead, bat wings are made of anatomical features that all mammals already have. Penguins have flippers for swimming, but they are clearly modified bird wings. Penguins do not have the same kind of flipper bones as whales do, who have different fins still than fish and sharks. Common purpose, different design, different parts. Even dolphins who are the same size, same color, share the same environment, same hunting grounds, same prey as sharks, same lifestyle, have bones analogous more to land mammals while sharks do not, uh, and sharks have gills while 
dolphins are mammals and breathe air, and they have totally different behavior. God clearly does not use common design for common purpose. Moreover, you're ignoring how drastically similar the design of Archaeopteryx and other theropods are. Because you use this common design, common need excuse whenever things get too close for you. It's a rescue device from when we're comparing anatomy that is so close as to be the same kind, and yet you don't want to admit that they're the same kind because that would be admitting macroevolution somehow. But at some point, you do agree that a similar enough morphology means that we can reasonably infer that they are related. But creationists are unable to articulate where that line is, because if they draw it too short, that means that the arc is overcrowded and it can't work. If they draw it too wide, that means that they've admitted a bunch of transitional species. So they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Because all we can go on is comparative anatomy, and their anatomy crosses boundaries and straddles the line. It has anatomy of two different kinds. The design of Archaeopteryx wings and modern bird wings is not even the same. Same purpose, different design. If it's common designs for common goals, why do theropods have the same design as Archaeopteryx? Same design, different purpose. Why does Archaeopteryx have design elements of both dinosaurs and modern birds? It's a transitional form and you can't get around it. Calling it a bird just proves you think theropods can be birds if they have natural variation like more feathers and fused bones. A wizard did it. Uh, There's also evidence of a phenomena called uh, uh, where the, the, when you pack something between two layers of, of rock, as it decays, it'll be a capillary action, pulling little filaments out that look like hairs or feathers, when it's actually just capillary action common between two tightly pressed layers of, of anything. You can put a drop of water on a piece of paper, put another piece of paper on top real tight, and there'll be capillary action, draw it out into little lines around it. So there are those who take that position, that the feathers, that they say they're feathers on dinosaurs, are actually just simple capillary action as the fossil forms, or as the fossil decays, as the creature decays. Why the fuck you lying? Why you always lying? Ooh, oh my God, stop fucking lying. Fluids and soft tissues don't fossilize, Kent. They're not found emanating from the main torso where you'd expect some fluids to be leaking from the body. The fact that they don't spread in all directions and are dispersed away from the main body of the animal shows that they are independent structures and did not come from leaking fluids. Dendrites are what I assume Kent is referring to with capillary action. And then one, notice how it does not occur at all near the body parts that would have the most fluids. Additionally, it looks nothing like the smooth hair-like projections of dino fuzz, which are definitely not capillary action because they don't branch in different directions. They have a very clear shape and grain to them, and tufts are found away from the body, showing that there was no capillary action, and there was directionality to this, unlike a diffusing liquid would, which would just go in all directions. That's the excuse you probably give for dino fuzz, but these are fully formed feathers. This is a velociraptor fossil with clear signs of plumage and feathers. And no, Kent, this is not some sort of capillary action here. These are clear feather shapes all in the same grain. They're not just spreading out in all locations. And these feathers are only found on the wings and the tail, just like Archaeopteryx. Interesting. The shape, size, and direction are inconsistent with capillary action of fluids from the extremities, while there are none emanating from the torso. Meanwhile, these markings are perfectly consistent with the shape of individual large feathers in the same patterns as Archaeopteryx. Again, capillary action with the radiate in all directions amorphously and certainly not shapes identical to Archaeopteryx. This does not happen by coincidence. Creationists have no morphological or anatomical basis to oppose feather evolution. The following is a demonstration of how basic skin cells make feathers. The epidermal layer provides the cells which make up the finished feather, while the underlying mesodermal layer serves as a temporary internal framework which contains tiny blood vessels that feed the growing structure. One of the first events of feather development is the aggregation of mesodermal cells into clusters. These clusters induce the overlying epidermis to proliferate, thicken, and elevate. Time-lapse microcinematography shows that within a day of explantation, a reorganization of some of the cells in the mesodermal layer takes place. The cells actively migrate and aggregate to form condensed clusters. Differences among feathers and feather tracts are determined by the cells of the mesodermal layer. In response to the condensation of cells in the mesoderm, 
The overlying epidermis begins to thicken by local cell proliferation. At the same time, the mesodermal cells push upward into the growing mound of epidermal cells, creating a mesodermal pocket. Soon, a small outgrowth of a roughly cylindrical form appears. These are anatomical placodes in development. Scales and hairs develop in the exact same way. They just break up differently. The cortex of the cylinder is made up of epidermal cells and the core of mesodermal cells. As development progresses, the epidermis continues to yield new cells and thickens radially. Cell divisions occur primarily at the base of the feather in the column of epidermal cells. The process, like one which adds new floors to a rising skyscraper in the basement level rather than on top, results in an elongation of the feather. At the apex of each fold, large cuboidal cells differentiate. These cells fuse into a longitudinal shaft, which is the barb of the down feather. At various levels, cells at the outer side of the barb shafts fuse to form barbules. Each barbule consists of a train of single elongate cells. Each barbule joins a barb shaft somewhere between the top of the rachis and a point a short distance from the barb tip, which is free of barbules. The cylindrical developing down feather is completely surrounded by a sheath. Normally, this dries and splits off at hatching, or it may be rubbed off, allowing the feather to splay open. This down feather was plucked from a chick embryo after about 19 days of incubation. As the feather becomes fully differentiated, the mesodermal cord dries up and retracts, and cells of the cortex, not incorporated into barbs or barbules, die and disappear. Finally, only the cells of the barbs and barbules remain, shown here in red. These dying cells become filled with keratin, a fibrous protein which is impervious to water when it hardens. I think you need to study some more on the actual Archaeopteryx and find out about them. I think many people have come to say that's nothing but just a bird with unusual features. There's also some evidence of some forgery with some of the fossils with Archaeopteryx gluing the tail on, etc., with the different matrix behind it. Oh my God, stop fucking lying. That isn't even what the claim is, Kent, but those dendrites we talked about earlier are actually found above the supposedly forged layers, proving that it can't have been forged. And there have been 11 specimens found, all with the same tails, all with feathers. Any anomalies have been explained by natural processes. Why, are you admitting the fact that uh, Archaeopteryx being a bird shouldn't have a really long reptile tail? Though interestingly, Creation.com uses fake fossils, which artificially look more bird-like, as their source for Archaeopteryx. You hypocrite! But again, you're putting an awful lot of weight on fossils that are dead, that you can't prove had any children. <laughs> Except that they laid eggs with identifiable dinosaurs inside them, Kent. I just proved my side, and additionally, I will prove yours wrong. Why would God specially create millions of species? just so they could not only go extinct, but that they would never even have any children. Yes, I oh, Archaeopteryx, absolutely. You know what Fiducia calls it, right? I even have slides on it. He calls it a bird, a true bird, a strong flyer. He calls it paleobabble to think it became, uh, came from a reptile. No, he did not say it was paleobabble to say Archaeopteryx came from a reptile. Let's look at his actual statement. Ellen Fiducia, world expert on birds. They tried to turn Archaeopteryx into an earthbound feathered dinosaur, but it's not. It's a bird, a perching bird. And here's that paleobabble quote. All he's objecting to is the notion that Archaeopteryx is a terrestrial theropod in that quote, which I agree with. It is a bird. I actually misspoke at some point saying it wasn't a bird. And what I was meaning to say was that its skeleton is that of a theropod, not of modern birds. But I agree with classifying Archaeopteryx as a bird. The point is that it's also a theropod, and he doesn't contradict that statement here. But Fiducia does reject that birds are theropods. However, that quote does not say that. Just that he rejects that it was terrestrial. But wait! There's more! Hang on to your seat, baby! Cause this one's a screamer! Fiducia asserts that birds are reptiles just that they branch off much closer to the beginning of archosaurs instead of later on from theropods. What is debated is which reptile lineages they are actually a part of. And creationists take quote snippets out of context to try and make it look like any of these scientists agree with them. Alan Fiducia said that in 1999, but in 2002, he publishes a paper entitled Birds Are Dinosaurs, Simple Answer to a Complex Problem, where he presents a few different lineages that could have been bird ancestors, including the theropods. The point is, he agrees that birds are evolved from reptiles. So why the hell are creationists quoting him? Fiducia agrees with me that birds evolved from reptiles. 
he just doesn't agree with the scientific consensus that they are specifically descended from the theropod group of dinosaurs because of fossils like Longisquama and Cosasaurus, which predate the theropods with bird-like features such as feathers and wing-like feathery scales, which disprove statements that there aren't intermediates between scales and feathers. We also know of several four-legged lizard species that are able to run on their hind legs. This is a feature already present in lizards. So evolution of theropods from archosaur-like reptiles is within-kind microevolution of existing adaptable traits. Okay, well, I've got slides and quotes of uh, evolutionists who would disagree with you. And yeah, well, but, you, but you know right? that that's not the evolutionary position, which is why you're debating it right now. Well, doesn't fiducia have uh, any important? I don't really care. Okay, well, I because, think you're exposed because we all know that. There. By all means, let's take a look at his arguments, but the source is unimportant. I don't care who says it. I'd rather talk about the arguments behind it and whether or not they're backed by evidence. It's a shame that we couldn't get into the evidence in this debate because we were arguing about how authoritative one random scientist's out-of-context comment was. Fiducia actually supports the scale-to-feather hypothesis, where scales directly evolved into feathers through elongation and fragmentation in arboreal reptiles. The tree-down hypothesis. He rejects the ground-up hypothesis, where feathers began as hair-like fibers or filamentous scales. Lizards already have hair-like keratin scales and projections, both thick and thin. Natural variation, even by creationist standards, could get them longer, into filaments or hairs or even feather shapes. It's likely that multiple kinds of feather-like scales have evolved separately, though it's unlikely to happen in exactly the same way each time. Bearded dragons clearly demonstrate that scales have the capacity to vary into long conical shapes that grow out from the skin and not just cover it flatly. A thinner version of this would be hair-like. Scales, feathers, and hairs grow from the same protein, same signaling pathways, and same structures. There are arguments in this paper that are interesting to address, such as... One of Fiducia's arguments is that Archaeopteryx had smooth alligator-like teeth and did not have analogous teeth to theropods. But assuming the theropod hypothesis, this is easily explained by evolutionary atavism. We know these traits can come and go, and old traits from the organism's previous lineage can resurface, or existing traits can be lost, or inactivated. There is nothing evolutionarily odd about losing ridges or losing bones or fusing bones, just as there is nothing odd about gaining them. In fact, it's much easier to g explain going backwards. And he admits that there are teeth devoid of serrations in theropod morphology already, he just says that they're atypical, meaning that there are some. Don't confuse this for some kind of breakdown of the pattern of the fossil record. All this confirms that feathers and feather-like structures predate even dinosaurs in the reptiles. I know this concept baffles creationists, but convergent evolution explains why multiple branching lineages of feathered reptiles could have proto-flight evolution without direct ancestry with modern birds. Evolution is not linear. Many similar populations would be evolving in the same direction under the same selection pressures, and some diverge further than others. The reason the scientific consensus rejects Fiducia's hypothesis is that the skeleton of Archaeopteryx and theropods evolved convergently in his hypothesis, but this is highly unlikely, though not impossible, because of how precisely similar they are. It's not like a question of whether or not the body or the skull is more likely to diverge or how quickly. It's about how precisely do traits tend to converge. Convergent evolution is basically only gross features like a wing, rough similarity through function, like how bird and bat wings are structurally different but with the same function, while Archaeopteryx and theropods appear to have overwhelmingly similar structure but for different functions, suggesting evolution, modification with descent, clearly over special creation with similar tools, and proving that certain animals can possess traits of multiple kinds, demonstrating a wide range of function to the same fundamental structure which natural variation can easily account for. Another example of Fiducia's arguments is the dendrite. These are dendrite crystals, again what Kent is probably meaning about capillary action in the rocks, and these are fossil feathers. Notice how they don't resemble each other in any way, shape, or form. The dendrites were mistaken for plants, not feathers, and scientists debunked that conjecture themselves without the help of young earth creationists. Sinosauropteryx feathers do not show patterns of diffusion or capillary action. These have a clear pattern of branching consistent only with feathers, and they have a clear grain like actual physical structures would have, not leaking fluids, which again would be drawn out in all directions. They don't appear like this. In fact, I could only find an example of this in Archaeopteryx fossils, which creationists already accept had feathers. 
Another example of Fiducia's arguments is that these so-called protofeathers have a widespread distribution in archosaurs is evidence alone that they have nothing to do with feathers. In all likelihood, there were probably multiple origins for feather-like structures. Hairs and filaments of feathers of various types have been found throughout millions of years of strata, all diverging in different directions. But scientists are sticklers for details. They want to know which lineage of feathery skin appendages was ancestral to modern birds. That is evidence that any one of these lineages could be ancestral to feathers, while others did not go that far. Because in evolution, if multiple populations have the same trait, they don't all have to evolve convergently. Most of the time, they evolve divergently. We wouldn't necessarily expect to see feathers pop up from every single population that had dinofuzz, because dinofuzz has a function on its own. However, we don't simply have dinofuzz on theropods, we have robust, full feathers, which is why this paper is out of date. Creationists constantly use outdated sources because they don't discuss new evidence which dramatically changes the conversation. It's not that a particular date makes something outdated, it's just that if there's new information that comes out since that's been published, we would rather know about that newer information. It's missing that information. So we don't get the full picture. We've also since found theropods with true feathers, not just protofeathers or dinofuzz, such as Velociraptor or Kaihong Juji. Kaihong Juji is a theropod dinosaur with extremely robust feathers, found in 2014, putting Fiducia's 2002 remarks about no confirmed true feathers on theropods firmly out of date. Although at first glance, this may look like just another Archaeopteryx, its skull is clearly that of a theropod. Even Fiducia could not argue this. With the same general skull shape of a theropod, and with curved theropod teeth, uncharacteristic of Archaeopteryx, it defies Fiducia's main arguments. Same with Microraptor and Angiornis. It is also older than Archaeopteryx, showing that Jurassic theropods are most likely the direct ancestors of Archaeopteryx. Since then, a lineage of theropods with small arms not capable of flight has also been found with beaks, with the children born with teeth, while the adults lose them as they age and develop a beak. This clearly demonstrates how a theropod can modify its fundamental structure into those characteristic of birds. Variation within theropods that produces bird features. And since Fiducia wrote this in 2002, new studies have been done that show that there is a frame shift in the expression of Hox gene's forefinger development, just as predicted in the 1990s, which Fiducia rejected, but then was experimentally demonstrated. He makes an argument that birds are descended from archosaurs because... In embryonic development, ostriches start with five fingers, but they fuse in a way that doesn't resemble theropod fingers. So if you'll notice, A and B would be more similar if the digit all the way on the right of B, digit 5, was on the left and was digit 1. But a frame shift would have actually done that genetically, and that's plausible. Fiducia doesn't really present a counter-argument other than, well, we didn't actually see it happen. But I would like to call attention to the fact that since Fiducia proposes that A is closer to D than to B, it still requires extreme growth of that, th that fourth digit and still requires the first digit to shrink significantly in order to get to A. Changing of the scale of existing bones is trivial in the course of evolution, so this is not a convincing argument. Moreover, we don't really have very good theropod embryonic skeletons, so we don't know whether theropods might have vestigial buds in embryonic development and lost them as they mature, as ostriches do. Fiducia also claims that dinofuzz could be connective tissues like the collagen fibers found in ichthyosaur. Simply put, they just aren't similar to dinofuzz. Look at the close-up from Sinosauropteryx. These are images of the collagen tissues in ichthyosaurs. See how they're going in random directions and do not taper or branch? This is Sinosauropteryx, and quote, areas of exceptionally well-preserved integumentary structures on the tail of Sinosauropteryx, all regions show smooth filament-like structures which taper towards their tips with no evidence of beating, as is suggested for degraded collagen. Fiducia is called out by others for inaccuracy on this very subject, and I have to say their arguments are much better. He also argues, Brum's view is shared by many paleontologists, birds are dinosaurs, therefore any filamentous material preserved in dromaeosaurs must represent protofeathers. Now I think this is a straw man because it is not therefore any material must be protofeathers. It is this material looks 
like a filamentous feather. And Archaeopteryx has the same basic skeleton as this creature. So it's a smaller leap to say that proto feathers developed into feathers than it is to say that they converged on the same exact skeletons after diverging for nearly the entire dinosaur age. Diverging uses for feathers and body sizes is a better explanatory and predictive hypothesis. Another of his arguments is, one must explain also why all theropods and other dinosaurs discovered in other deposits where integument is preserved exhibit no dinofuzz, but true reptile skin devoid of any feather-like material. I disagree. This is easily explained by speciation. Some subspecies may not have had feathers, so that's like saying hairless dogs aren't dogs just because they don't have hair. No, they're a subspecies. They could also have simply been in environments where feathers don't preserve well. Plus, many of these feathers do have hardened raci, even though fiducia complains they do not. These species were found in very different locations, and feathers do not always preserve anyway. The conditions of the Chinese specimens may have been favorable to preserving feathers. That's it. I'm not suggesting Archaeopteryx is a direct descendant from Velociraptor and Deinonychus, just that it is a sister derived, or that Archaeopteryx diverged early in the theropod lineage, since it would seem many theropods were becoming more and more bird-like. Archaeopteryx was the one that eventually fully adapted to that niche. He writes, There is substantial evidence to support the alternative hypothesis, that is, the classical scale-to-feather model, which conforms nicely with what we know about 1. Feather embryology, 2. The fact that avian foot scoots can be transformed into feathers using either bone morphogenetic protein or retinoic acid, and 3. The fact that primitive early Cretaceous birds, Confucius ornus and Protopteryx, have two central tail feathers that are scale-like without branching. However, in addition, it is particularly interesting to note that in half-developed ostrich embryos, there is a zone of more or less delimited scales near the dorsal border of the lateral apterium. The border of each scale is a feather rudiment already sunk into a short feather sac near the posterior end. At the margin of the scale-covered area of the pectoral callosity, particularly in rhea, the scales appear to be combined with feathers at the top of each scale. This close developmental association of scale and feather would be remarkable if feathers evolved through a filament stage. It would not be remarkable, because we wouldn't expect it to be the case either way. Embryological development doesn't have to follow every intermediate from its evolutionary past. There will be some remnants of evolutionary history, since every system is a modified version of what came before, but it would be hard to explain how a downy feather could convert directly into a flight feather. In modern times, we observe down feathers being shed and replaced with plumage. We don't see one converting to the other, and thus we wouldn't expect it in an embryo anyway. It would originate from the same anatomical features and signaling pathways, though, and this is observed. A flight feather and a downy feather grow differently and break up their branches differently. To get a flight feather, you would just shed down and have to start over. Slight differences in signaling can cause the keratin appendage to grow differently, but once it is broken up, it can't be reformed so you would expect a placo to produce either down or flight feathers. It can either break up to form one shape or break up to form another. It wouldn't go through both stages. In feather development, it does all develop from a single filament reminiscent of bearded dragon beard scales, followed by a period of fusing the different branches to the central rachis and the degradation of material between the branches. So the protofeather hypothesis still stands. We'd expect the same thing either way. But Fiducia does present several pieces of interesting evidence, like the fact that Confucius Ornus tail feathers are scale-like and non-branching. These are very close to modern birds in their morphology, so this is another wrench in the creationist argument. Fiducia is also right to point out that feathers can be found growing from scales, and scientists have induced scales to switch into feathers, both in birds and in reptiles. Feathers are proven to grow from scales, and both from the same signaling pathways with miter modifications, which is why scales can be converted to feathers. Since scale is just a flat mass, it can convert directly into feather shapes. This is observable, repeatable, testable science predicted and executed due to evolution without the help of a single young earth creationist idea. We also know of extant and extinct species where leafy elongated scales look like unbranched, stubby, embryonic feathers. I feel the strongest evidence for the classical model is simply the skull and feather-like scales of Cosasaurus, the scales of Longusquama, and the tail of Confucius Ornus. 
all indicative of direct scale to feather elongation and breaking up into branches. The skull is a dead ringer for Archaeopteryx and it has mostly the same bones, though noticeably different proportions, but the consensus opinion is more likely because of fossils like Kaihang, which shows that either both hypotheses are correct or that the theropod hypothesis is correct. The likelihood of the two lineages, Kosasaurus and theropods, converging on not just the same skeleton size and proportions, but the same feather type, the same date range, is extremely low, though not impossible, but since Kaihang appears transitional between Archaeopteryx and theropods in the same date range, the theropod hypothesis appears more likely. Also, within other theropods, we have Archaeopteryx-like skulls. It's more likely that these skulls converge than these skeletons converge, not because one is inherently more likely, but because of the precision and scope of the similarity of the body versus the relatively smaller similarity of the skulls and it would be hard to explain how these are fundamentally different kinds. If these are the same kind, then so are these. If these are the same kind, then so are these. The filamentous intermediate model for feathers is a better explanation than the direct scale to feather model, because feathers are made from a conical skin growth filled with small keratin filaments that fuse together differently, all near the bottom in the case of downy filamentous feathers, or alternating along the length of a central rachis in the case of flight feathers. It's harder to explain how a fragmented elongate scale would be a precursor to this process since and there's many more evolutionists who do not embrace Archaeopteryx as an ancestor to a bird. Okay. No, not many. And did Bill misspeak here? Bill just said that they reject Archaeopteryx as a bird, which is just plain false. Even the quote he gave directly says it's a bird. Bill's mistakes are so egregious, he either can't keep his own story straight, or he's deliberately muddying the waters so that we don't figure out that Fiducia says that birds are reptiles. Hopefully I'll be able to clarify this with him in the future. Okay. Well, Fiducia, Ellen Fiducia, North Carolina State disagrees with you. I don't care. And there's no disagreement on the important point, which is that birds are reptiles. He just disagrees which reptile evolved into birds, and I suspected as much. I looked it up, as per Bill's advice, and poor Bill is so inaccurate to the point of asserting the exact opposite of his own citations. Bill says they reject that Archaeopteryx is a reptile, but the quote he gave only rejects it as a theropod, and if you actually read Fiducia's research, he explicitly supports the idea that Archaeopteryx and all birds were evolved from reptiles, just not the theropod reptiles. Just as I predicted in the debate. Creationists would frame this uncertainty as incompetence, but what they ignore is that there is such uncertainty because there is overwhelming morphological similarity between many types of organisms when they are closely related. Why are they talking him up as if he's so important? Because he has an alternative theory on reptile to bird evolution? Does Bill actually not understand what Fiducia is saying, or did he just not read anything else about him after telling others to look him up? They had very strange traits that birds have today. Uh, Stars, Olson, you've heard of him, right? One of the grander hoaxes of a Are you familiar with Stars Olson? No. Of course. Please write it down. He was the bird man in the United States, S-T-O-R-R-S Olson. He called it a hoax, the equivalent of cold fusion. Uh, no, he actually was just complaining about media rushing to sensationalize preliminary findings. He was calling dinosaur feathers a hoax, but it turns out that since 1999, we have confirmed that theropods had feathers. This quote fragment does not come from a peer-reviewed paper, and my same arguments stand to Olson, but of course I am calling out the creationists using him, since these comments are about 20 years out of date. Storrs Olson has published papers acknowledging old earth and fossil record going back millions of years, and has commented that longest guama scales can only be feathers. Next time you cite Storrs Olson or Alan Fiducia, please be sure to include the fact that they strongly support things like old earth, convergent evolution, feather to scale evolution, and reptile to bird evolution in the hypotheses you are citing. Bill acts like these guys are such a big deal as if he's ever heard of them before reading their name on some creationist website, and as if they don't support reptile to bird evolution. They just throw these obscure quotes out there to distract people, but the great thing is I get to do a debunking video. So, just as creationists feel empowered to challenge trained experts on the consensus, I feel qualified to challenge the dissenting experts from 20 years ago with modern evidence, and as a biologist myself, I hope I do my due diligence to avoid any Dunning-Kruger bias by sourcing all my claims with demonstrable evidence. Clearly demonstrable effects backed up by the reviewed opinions of experts. I've certainly demonstrated that creationists do no such thing. 
If the creationists really valued the opinions of these scientists who seem to just be defending their own pet theories, then creationists should be accepting scale to feather evolution, as Fiducia and Olson do. But they're just using these quotes to make it seem at first glance like there are scientists who question the evolutionary hypothesis and deeper to cast doubts on evolution as a whole by overplaying scientists' disagreements over phylogeny. Instead, creationists end up citing people who make it absolutely clear that birds are evolved from reptiles and feathers from scales, whether it be tree-climbing lizards or terrestrial raptors. So let's review the evidence one last time. The scientific consensus is that theropod dinosaurs had feathers and produced the bird lineage. The same structure is accepted by creationists as feathers in Archaeopteryx are found with Velociraptor and other small theropods. Those scientists who reject the theropod-to-bird transition support reptile-to-bird evolution with scales going directly to feather shapes and split into barbs from there, and that's important in feather evolution, but their objections to dinosaurs having feathers are notably out of date. Biologists have been able to chemically convert scales to feathers, and feathers have been found naturally growing directly out of scales. Feathers have been proven to be made of the same protein, keratin, and to develop from the same anatomical cell groups in the skin known as anatomical placodes. Embryology. Ostriches and other birds grow five fingers and three finger bones before losing two fingers and fusing their three finger bones as embryos. There is no reason for an intelligent designer to program his design to grow parts that will be deleted very early in embryological development. This is exclusively indicative of natural modification of prior systems through descent. Herrerasaurus, the basal theropods, had five digits, while others have three or four, even two fingers. So there's already natural variation in the theropods for digit number because remember, you can't fit all theropod species on the ark. They have to be able to diversify from a single breeding pair. Were each of these separately created, or can microevolution account for different finger counts and shapes? If so, can't it account for the same skeletal differences between Archaeopteryx? Chickens have been induced to grow alligator-like teeth in their jaws from an active DNA in their genome. Terrestrial theropod Limosaurus shows fully formed beaks in adults and toothed, non-beaked young. These kinds of features are explained away by creationists as needed for chicks to escape the shell, but the shell tooth of modern birds is on top of the beak, not inside the jaw. Even if it was repurposing shell tooth DNA, where did the DNA localization to the inner jaw come from? If special creation were true, there should be no information for locating teeth inside the jaw in birds. Lemosaurus did have a furcula, or fused collarbone, but had no perching toes. Scientists at the University of Chile have induced development of dinosaur-like forward-facing perching toes and more dinosaur-like toe bones in general. The same university also reported inhibition of maturation genes let chicken fibulae grow long and tubular like those of theropod dinosaurs, which connect with the ankle. Chickens normally develop vestigial fibulae that become withered and short. Biologists researching beak evolution and development at Harvard University have used gene inhibitors to grow chickens with reptile-like skulls, and they are observed to have been otherwise completely healthy. If life were irreducibly complex, we couldn't take away anything and still make something like in these examples. Turns out, what is made when we inhibit some of the more recent adaptations, that the evolutionary predictions come true. Dinosaur-specific morphology underlies modern bird genetic adaptations. When we turn off parts of bird genetics or inhibit their development, we get dinosaur and reptile features, showing birds are built from reptile parts. If evolution is true, then we should be able to take away modifications and wind up with something evolution predicts would be a more primitive form. If evolution is not true, we shouldn't be able to do this unless God used modification with descent in his laboratory to arrive at his designs. Either the designs are evolved, derived, and directly related through God's design process, or they are derived and evolved and related through the observed process of biological evolution. Morphology. Theropods, modern birds, and proavians like Archaeopteryx all had pneumatic bones, that is, air sacs unique to birds among the living animals today. Theropod dinosaurs were also very active partially due to their light bones, and were thus likely warm-blooded. We see within-kind variation of warm-bloodedness as well, so we know that this trait can evolve. Theropods already had these features, so the only real difference between them and birds is the scale of their bones and feathers. And just to confirm things, a scaly reptile tail was found preserved in amber, and shows exceptionally preserved dino fuzz as clearly primitive feathers. The sample shows fairly thin skin close to the bone, contrary to the hypothesis, that fossilized dino fuzz is degraded connective tissue. Examples of beaks are found in dinosaurs as well. Oviraptor is also famously a theropod dinosaur with a beak. If you take every example of within-kind variation, where some proavians and some theropods have beaks while others do not, but you say they're special creations and therefore not related, your criteria are too loose. 
you have to choose less than 1% of the supposed kind as a base form that evolved into other subspecies, otherwise you'll have no room in the arc. Ergo, you must accept within-kind variation of beaks and non-beaks within theropod kind, therefore bird beaks can grow from small feathered theropods who have basically the same skeleton as birds, with a few differences. Dinosaurs were likely already warm-blooded and had hollow bones and had feathers. The overall skeleton morphology is the same, the tail, the limbs, the ribs, the vertebrae, all analogous except a few bones are fused in Archaeopteryx and a few more are fused in birds. This transitional form occurs between them in the rock layers. It just so happens that everything is buried in the same order as an evolutionary transition would be in. Archaeopteryx and birds share a fused collarbone, known as a furcula, again no new information like creationists mean, just different information from the same existing structures. A theropod fusing its collarbone is repurposing existing structures for a new one. Theropods and Archaeopteryx have gastralia, a sort of second set of ribs, a feature unique to reptiles but not present in any modern birds. Birds have a thick breastbone that are used for anchoring flight muscles. Everything in evolution is modified from something that is pre-existing in the parent generation. Archaeopteryx also has the same leg bones as theropods where birds are fused. If you put them in the order they're found in the fossil record, it produces a clear transition from separate theropod bones to fused foot bones to perching toes. By the way, we know that within-kind variation can create perching toes. Since we have reversed the process experimentally, while Archaeopteryx skulls have deviated a lot from theropods, there are other bird-like theropods whose skull is distinctly theropod while having easily seen feathers like Archaeopteryx and the same body skeleton and size from about the same date range. These include Kaihong and Microraptor notably. They inarguably have feathers, and they also have furcula, but they have theropod skulls and robust curved serrated teeth which is uncharacteristic of Archaeopteryx and all modern birds. These examples also lack fused foot bones and perching toes, which fits theropods, but is uncharacteristic of birds. This further shows transition between theropods and birds is simply within-kind adaptation of existing traits. They are the same kind as Archaeopteryx, but also clearly small theropods. Theropods had feathers. That is settled science at this point. Not only do we have concrete examples of theropods with feathers, but evidence of quill knobs on theropods something only observed on birds today. Even Deinonychus has a furcula, so it's not a bird-only feature. Theropod dinosaurs have every bird feature already, furcula, beaks, feathers, and have existing parts like gastralia that turn into breast bones. The theropod dinosaurs and all the birds found near each other in the fossil layers just happen to have almost exactly the same skeletons. A flood cannot sort animals like this, and the crossover is fully covered by microevolution. Archaeopteryx and Proavians had no beaks. Why was an entire order of birds specially created with no beaks? Why was this entire order killed off? We know of theropods that had feathers and beaks, so these bird features are already in theropod lineages. Again, birds today do not have teeth, but can be mutated to have teeth with ancient inactivated DNA. So to call Archaeopteryx a bird again demonstrates transitional forms. Archaeopteryx has the anatomy more closely related to dinosaur theropods, and yet it is a bird. If the natural variation of theropods and the natural variation of birds cross over and we find transitional forms within that crossover, within the date range expected, that pretty much confirms the theory right there. Macroevolution is explained by microevolution. Change my mind. Add them up and it appears to be a macroevolution, but they are still in the same monophyletic order, the same kind, but now some traits are extremely exaggerated in one species while other traits are extremely exaggerated in other subspecies. They are so specialized that they don't look similar anymore despite having common origins. This is the crux of the entire disagreement, and creationists refuse to even provide goalposts for what would count as an example of macroevolution. Just hypothetically, so we can define terms and stop stop talking past one another. Archaeopteryx undeniably has traits characteristic of both birds and theropods, and, and birds have exclusively theropod-derived traits, meaning they don't have any traits that theropods don't have. It's only a matter of putting them together differently, and some features get extremely exaggerated. And it's not the only fossil that bridges this gap, there are smooth transitions from theropods to Archaeopteryx and from them into birds.
Most creationists won't even go as far as to say all birds are related. Okay, so why would you call an ostrich or a penguin a bird then if they're not the same kind? If these have nothing to do with each other outside of both having beaks and feathers? That's like saying zebras and tigers are the same kind because they both have hair and stripes. No, it's more fundamental than that, and creationists know it. For example, if penguins are a special creation, God obviously designed flying birds first and then reused those parts, tweaked them a little, to make a penguin. And this is a terrible explanation because God can just put anything on a penguin. He doesn't have to limit himself to bird parts, and yet that's exactly what we see. And we see incremental chronological change. Same with the early birds. Their literal frame is that of another supposedly separate kind. Are these the same kind? Are these the same kind? Are these the same kind? What about these? These? How about these? Then why not these? The differences between birds and theropods are so minimal that even the differences among theropods are often larger than between theropods and birds, certainly between other theropods and Archaeopteryx. Archaeopteryx is just one theropod deviation, but so many theropods have deviated in so many ways, within their kind, from microevolution, that we know that the evolutionary change required for theropod to bird evolution is smaller than the observed natural variation within more basal theropods themselves. Therefore, the transition to birds is covered by microevolution on a scale that creationists already accept. Any variation within kind is explained by microevolution. Creationists need it to explain away holes in their flood myth, but they cannot accept that the vast range of microchanges that occur within the theropod kind can be applied to bird transition, despite the fact that feathers, beaks, and all Archaeopteryx features already appear within the theropod radiations. The closest possible organisms to Archaeopteryx display transitional features between the two as well. So, what does the word bird even mean to creationists? Clearly, there is some shared derived morphology, so creationists have to resort to blatant lies like that genetics simply can't produce that kind of diversity. However, what they cannot deny, even assuming God, is that God appears to have derived his designs exactly as evolution would, by tweaking existing ones. If you think this is a bird, then you already understand how a dinosaur becomes a bird, because this bird is made entirely from theropod dinosaur parts. As we look through the chronological changes, we see all of them are just dialing up or down the expression and mixture of features that theropod dinosaurs already had within their order. These traits don't change abruptly. We see the gradual accumulation of a natural variation of differences, which allows new functions for old parts. When the traits of birds and dinosaurs bleed into each other, and in the middle are multiple species with both theropod and bird features mixed, it's pretty clear that there is no evolutionary limit between birds and dinosaurs. The only limitation is the traits of the parent generation, and we see that kind of inheritance. Evolutionary theory models this so accurately that we were able to predict when and where the transitions would be. Creationists have never done this for any fossil. The last time creationists contributed to science was to disprove catastrophism, aka the flood model, which gave rise to modern geology and all of this before Darwin's Origin of Species was published. Crocodilian reptiles have the closest genetic relationship with birds today, as evolution predicts. Scientists have sequenced the entire genome of several bird species and some crocodilians, so feel free to compare them yourself. You have to have pretty weak faith to only believe in God if creationism is true. Why would you deny the genius of a system that allows life to adapt to its surroundings? Well, they actually accept a lot of evolution, but arbitrarily decide when they do and don't want evolution to occur in order to adhere to a childish interpretation of a silly, ancient myth. For a story about a global flood, the lessons creationists seem to think the story is telling are rather shallow. Even assuming the Christian religion is true, I think the myth is more than just a zoology lesson, don't you think? And when you order the fossils in the same order they're found in the layers, you can see clear transition in the form of microevolution and adaptation of within-kind existing traits. That doesn't happen by chance in a flood. Floods mix everything up. It's mathematically impossible for the flood to arrange things in the evolutionary order for every series of life forms. Creationists have no excuses. The evolutionary case is airtight, and their case has several morbid holes in it. What's the better explanation for an Archaeopteryx's morphology? 
there is absolutely no reason the entire order of birds that have huge similarities with theropod skeletons that are found between theropods and modern birds would have been specially created just to be completely wiped out at the beginning of human history, other than to confuse people and lead them to believe in evolution. Why would this entire collection of bird species be so different, and why are those the exact species the ones that are all extinct? This could only mean God deliberately made their anatomy unable to escape the flood, deliberately less fit than other types of birds while coincidentally sharing most of their traits with theropods. Hopefully I've provided enough evidence to show that theropods had feathers. The fact that theropod specific tails have been found with perfectly preserved primitive feathers and several fossilized full specimens have been found with the same structures should be good enough. Even Answers in Genesis has to buckle at the overwhelming evidence. They admit that species like Colindodromius had what they call bristles. Now this is either an admission that dinosaurs evolved hairs or an admission that they evolved proto feathers. Either way, this dinosaur had evolved these bristles. Oh, and these aren't collagen fibers either, as they occur on top of the scales and don't crisscross. We know the range of change within any kind they attempt to define is so large that it always justifies macroevolution. When there is morphological crossover to the point that we have dinosaurs with feathers, we have birds with dinosaur bodies, Archaeopteryx types with dromaeosaur heads, and we have beaked theropods, just looking at the range of variation within them, we already know the shape, size, number, location, and proportion of all kinds of traits like skulls, arm and leg bones, any bone really, teeth, jaws, even skin appendages, all vary widely within kind meaning at least some of them evolved from a single pair of precursors that didn't necessarily have any of those things, like beaks or feathers, while their within-kind descendants did. Thus, there is no objection to bird evolution that creationists can hold on adaptational grounds. Neither the scale to feather, trees down, nor the scale to filament, ground up hypothesis, are morphologically impossible. We simply have more evidence and direct transitions for the ground up hypothesis since all major transitions are accounted for, while the trees down hypothesis still relies on yet undiscovered transitional forms. So creationists are going to have to explain why assuming these structures evolved helps us predict what kinds we'll find and where, much better than global flood assumptions do, and why since feather morphology changes are within the limitations of observed microevolution, Ancient myths that have produced no results should be called science, while science, which has produced actual material results, should be dismissed as a religion.